A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive? As many as seven times. Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property, in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his, his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized one of his fellow servants and started to choke him, demanding, Pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had the fellow servant put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now, when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you the entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. What I'd like to do uh, here this evening is focus on this first reading from the Book of Sirach. Uh, Book of Sirach is, is one of the books that's in the Catholic Bible, but not in the Protestant Bible. And so we've, um, we've, we've had it there for 2,000 years. They took it out at some point, but that's another homily at all, all together. Uh, but it's, it's really a, a beautiful thing, uh, a, a beautiful a book. It belongs to the Old Testament. It's one of the wisdom books. And it's full of nuggets, absolute treasures that some of them you can just pick out and, and um, like, like the very first line. Wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner hugs them tight. Wow, okay, that's, that's some, some deep thought. And it's like such an insight into the, the, the human, human condition, the human person. And, and here, the sinner, that's like all of us. That's not just, just some guy over there or some lady over there. No, it's like it's all of us. We all do that. Uh, the, what the, the book of Sirach was written in Alexandria and e Egypt, uh, just a, maybe a, um, like a one or two hundred years before Christ's um, coming, and um, and basically this this gentleman who wrote it was basically it was uh, he was publishing what his grandfather had written back in in Egypt or back in Israel, and so he brings it to Egypt and it, uh, it takes on some of the the local color, the the Greek wisdom, and so. It all comes together in just a wonderful thing. So, by the way, if, if, you like like, if you like listening to Stoics and getting into that, well, this is even better still. Dig into this. And the book of Proverbs and the book of Wisdom. You know, we're book of Sirach. Okay, so, now he's talking about, there, there's three things that are, or rather two things here that, that he's referring to. We have wrath and anger, and he is connecting it to forgiveness. Okay, so what so I want to do is take this apart a little bit so that we too can uh, delve in and spend a little time with it. So when he says wrath and anger are hateful things, he's, he's referring to, excuse me, a specific kind of anger. So anger in and, in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not always intrinsically evil. It often can be. And that's usually the way we think about it. But there can be legitimate anger. For example, when it's a proper reaction to maybe some injustice that's about to be committed or being committed. And so anger comes up inside of us and we do something in order to stop it. 
That's legitimate. When there's some good, some justice that should be done, some truth that should be defended, it, it, it like boils up on us and we, we want to do something about it. The, the anger, and here I'm talking about the good kind, gives us the energy to do something difficult. I need to fight this thing. I need to fight this physical thing. There's somebody attacking me or attacking my loved ones. It can also be a moral thing too. We have this moral energy and strength that comes to fight the good fight. Our, our Lord at times showed good and proper and holy anger. He called out the scribes and the Pharisees, you hypocrites, look at what you're doing. But he was doing it based on love, love for them and love for the truth. He also cleared out the temple. He saw that, that the, his, the, the temple was being turned into a marketplace and so he takes these cords and, and wraps them up into a whip and he's, he's tipping tables and, and, uh, and, throw, uh, and, and chasing them chasing him out, chasing out the, the animals uh, and just what, what should be a nice calm place of prayer is turned into a carnival. Not trying to make too strong of a connection to Mulberry Street right now. But, so, so you see, anger can be a good thing. And, and actually, sometimes a sin could be when I'm not getting angry enough. It's usually not a, a problem, usually not. But maybe some, ah, well, why don't we just let it go? It's not that big a deal. We don't want the conflict. We don't relish conflict. And so we just kind of say, you know what? I'm just going to let it go. Meanwhile, something's getting steamrolled that deserves your fight. So maybe something internal to you. Or maybe uh, some other situation. Okay, so there, that's an example of where anger can be righteous and important and, the, uh, and good. It's based on love for God, for others, for truth, for justice. That's good anger. Okay. The kind of anger that he's talking about here in the book of Sirach isn't that. It's the other kind of wrath is the, the one word that he uses here. So there's two ways in which anger typically is not good. One kind is when it's disproportionate. When this surging up inside of us, yes, it's for a good reason, but man, you just really overdid it. Okay, for example, road rage. Somebody does something very risky and like cuts in front of you and they're weaving in and out or, or something like that. And they, they actually kind of, not in a real big way, but in, in, a, in, a, in a real way, they, they did something, they took, uh, they made a risk with your life and your vehicle and, and other people on the road. And so you get angry, upset. That should, that should trigger something inside. But when you take your baseball bat out and go to their windshield with it, okay, I think we just got a little bit out of control. That is disproportionate reaction to the actual situation. We can have that too. When we just blow up about something, we realize, yeah, that was important, but I, I just, I went too far with the words I said. I just, it was an exaggeration, even though it was founded on something of love and truth. So the other, so that's the first, uh, a disproportionate anger. The other kind is when it's not based on love and not based on defending the truth. It's based on something that it should not be based on. Like, I'm trying to defend my inflated pride. They called me out on something that, that was actually true, and I didn't like that, and I didn't like the way they said it, and now I'm, I'm, I'm going on the offensive. I'm, going the I'm angry now. Maybe someone is trying to stop me from doing, committing some injustice or some sin or some fault of charity. A, a good example of a anger based on the wrong thing would be uh, sort of like the classic sports example of a, a sore loser. They lose their temper and they start throwing punches uh, in, the, in the middle of the, the game because they're angry that they're losing and they're making me lose and, and, you know, and I don't deserve this. 
And so, so it's based on vanity, it's based on pride, it's based on all these other things except love and truth. But the, the very first line, I'll read it again. Wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner hugs them tight. We don't want to let go of those things. They come and, and we, we're, we're upset and we don't want to let it go. And then we're, 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 we're nourishing it and we're feeding that all the rest of the day. Yeah, and well, the next time that they say that and they tell me that I shouldn't have done this, that, or the other thing at work, I know how I'm going to respond. I'm going to say this. And then I'd say that. And then they would be the one that asking me for forgiveness. And, and so we, we, we play out these things in our head and just let them spin and spin. And, and we're nourishing evil in our hearts. It's unhealthy. <laughs> Yet every one of you was, who was shaking your head know exactly what I'm talking about because you do it. Yes, I do it too. That's why I know about this stuff. Okay, now, but now, the, what's the connection with forgiveness? The next lines here, further down in this paragraph. By the way, we're in chapter 27. There's a whole bunch of chapters, a lot of other themes, like a lot of other themes. Here's the line. Could anyone nourish anger against another? and expect healing from the Lord? Nourishing anger, letting it in there, festering it, feeding it, letting the imagination just run with it and relishing it. And then say, and Jesus, please heal me. Already you see the, 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 inter- the, the, the hypocrisy of that. The next line. Could anyone refuse mercy to another and seek pardon for his own sin? I'm not forgiving you, but uh, Lord, could you please? The connection lies in the fact that it's a state of heart that we have which prevents us that we, or we're, we're doubling down and deciding, I will not show mercy, I will not show love. We've just closed our own heart down and shut it off to the very one who wants to give those things to us. So we can't, it's, we only have one heart. And if it's closed down, shut off, even the things we would like to have can't get in. It's not that God's saying, okay, if you're going to be like that, all right, sure, I'll show you. I won't forgive you. No, so he can't forgive you. And he wants to forgive you. Because our heart's just not able to receive it. It's closed off. But now, now let's, let's switch it around just a little bit, just to play with the sentence here. Instead of, could anyone nourish anger against another and expect healing from the Lord? How about this? Could anyone nourish love toward another and expect healing from the Lord? Yes. Could anyone give mercy to another and seek pardon for his own sins? Of course. Because that's a heart that's open towards the other. Even someone who's sinning sinning against me. And maybe there isn't even a righteous and good anger that I have towards the individual, towards the situation, what's happened. But it's based on truth and love and not pride or egoism. Well, now my heart's both open towards them even as I might fight them. And because it's open there, it's also open towards God. You see, when, when we nourish good things or nourish bad things and hang on to and hug tight, as, as he says there, in, in any given relationship, it affects all the rest of our relationships. I can't nourish uh, anger towards this person and expect that I'm going to be perfectly good and open and generous and noble towards the other people, important people in my life who I do want to love. You have one heart. Those things affect us. And as I strive to love those people that are close to me, I strive to love even those who I'm angry with, well, that, there, there it has the opposite effect. It's not infecting those other relationships. It is nourishing those other relationships, even though in this particular one it's rough. But it's based on love. It's 
based on truth and seeking those things in a proportionate way. Ask parents, uh, those of you who are, uh, uh, have, have kids or, or, um, or, or just in your own life experience, you know when parents can get really exasperated with their kids at, at, at times, but it's because of their love for them and not because of a lack of it, not for a lack of it. And so even in exasperation, love doesn't diminish until they become teenagers, then it all falls apart. But then it's, uh, that's another situation altogether. So anyways, so what I wanted to do just to, to, to finish off here is just talk about this. Because we, we can find ourselves in moments when, yes, I've been nourishing anger. I have been, I've been refusing mercy to somebody else. And I've been, as, as the next line says, cherishing wrath but I don't want to, and I know it's not good for me, and Lord, how can I get out of this cycle? Well, I'll give you three, uh, three pro tips here. The first one, take it to confession. Take it there. Lord, I've been nourishing anger against this person. Lord, I was exaggerated in my reaction to this other person. Lord, forgive me. Because there now, now you're opening it back, you're cranking your heart back open. And now all of a sudden, you're, it's back open towards this person, it's back open towards God, and he can come in. So, and so we pray also for an openness of heart. Maybe, okay, well, it's not worth, I can't get the confession yet, it's midweek or whatever, but, but pray for, Lord, help me to forgive. I want to forgive. And already you're making the journey forward. And then also to pray for those who sin against you. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So that's, we're, we're asking our Lord, Lord, in as much as I'm able to forgive this person, please forgive me. And I, I know I need to be able to forgive this person more so that you can forgive me more. And it's not because he's being chintzy with his forgiveness. It's because our heart is too constricted to be able to receive it. Mercy is the forgiveness we need but don't deserve so he wants to give it to us anyways. Other people in our life need your forgiveness. They might not deserve it, but our Lord is asking for us to give it to them anyways. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.